I don't know if you know this or not, but today is my very first Father's Day. And I couldn't be more thrilled because a man can have a lot of accomplishments in his life. He can climb the ladder of corporations. He can become the most popular man in the whole wide world. He could have all the money in the bank. And I used to think, man, those are great accomplishments. But when you look at something so beautiful, so innocent as a child. Especially one that came from you. You think to yourself, God, what did I do to deserve this? What on earth did I do? Because I'm going to tell you right now, I don't know what I did to deserve it. But when I see her I know how God sees us. He looks at us and he says, I will go to the end of the earth and do whatever I have to do to make sure that you are taken care of. And the Holy Father in this place today, he looks at you with eyes of fire. He looks at you with eyes of love. And all he wants is free will for us to say, God, I love you. I don't want to have to force that baby to say, I love you. When that baby looks at me and smiles, I melt like an ice cream cone in the middle of this heat index. I don't have nobody to testify with me about how hot it has been outside. You step outside and you melt. And you're like, what the heck is this? This morning, I want to go ahead and just... First off, my parents were not able to be here today, but I want to wish my father a very happy Father's Day because without you, I wouldn't be here. Amen. I want to wish my father-in-law a happy Father's Day, the father of this house. Pastor, I thank you for giving me this opportunity to be able to preach this morning. Nothing feels better than to do what you are called to do I'm going to put this on. Do what you are called to do on your very first Father's Day. My heart is full today. So I want to thank you for giving me this opportunity to preach. And before I go any farther, Pastor, I just want to submit myself to you in this pulpit. If I'm out of line, if I say anything, feel free to yank me by the neck and drag me out that door. Some people might say... Some people might say, some people might say, oh, well, if you're led by the, the Spirit of God, you shouldn't have to submit yourself to, well, some people like to blow in, blow up, and then blow out and leave the pastor there to pick up all the pieces of what he's worked hard to do. And so I just want to say that this man has put his blood, sweat, and tears into this house. And so I submit myself to you today. Uh, today I'm going to be reading out of the New Living Translation. If you have a Bible like mine, you're going to be turning to page, I'll tell you right now, 848. But we're going to be in the book of Luke, chapter 15, verse 11. Today I'm going to speak to you on the subject matter the father is the father is the book of Luke chapter 15 verse 11 if you got it say amen, amen. if you don't got to say hold on all right all right if you would, if you could just make me comfortable, can we just stand for the reading of God's word? If you are able to stand, 
We are going to read a little bit of scripture here. It might be more than some of us have read all month, but that's okay. Jesus told them this story. A man had two sons. The younger son told his father, I want my share of the estate now before you die. So his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. A few days later, this young son packed all of his belongings and moved to a distant land. And there he wasted all of his money in wild living. About the time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land and began to starve. And the boy began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him. And the man sent him into the fields to feed his pigs. The young man became so hungry that even the husk in the pods he was feeding on, the pigs were feeding on, looked good to him. But no one gave him anything. You know you are in a tough spot when you can't even get some slop. Can I get, no, but hey, ain't nobody had to open up a can of beanie weenies because you didn't have nothing else to eat. I just want to know if there's anybody in this house that has ever been in a spot where you was hungry. You looked in the cabinet and you said, man, I am starving. This man couldn't even eat what the pigs was eating. He had nothing. When he finally came to his senses, somebody say, when he came to his senses, he said to himself, at home, even my father's hired servants have enough to spare. And here I am dying of hunger. I will go home to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me as one of your hired servants. So he returned home to his father, and while he was still a long way off, somebody say a long way off, the father saw him coming filled with love and compassion he ran to his son embraced him and kissed him his son his, and kissed him his son said to him father i have sinned against both heaven and you and i am no longer worthy of being called your son but his father said to the servants quick bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet and kill the calf that we've been fattening up we must celebrate with feast for this son of mine was dead and is now returned to life he was lost but now he is found so the party began meanwhile out in the field the older brother was working When he returned home, he heard the music and the dancing. And he asked one of the servants, hey, what's going on up there? Somebody look at your neighbor and say, hey, what's going on up there? And the servant replied, your brother has returned home. And your father has killed the fattened calf. And we are celebrating because of his safe return. The older brother was so angry and wouldn't go in. So his father had to come out and beg him. But he replied, all these years I have slaved for you and never once refused to do any single thing you have told me to. And in all the time you never gave me even a young goat for a feast with my friends. Yet when this son of yours comes back, you're squandering your money, well, after squandering your money on prostitutes, you celebrate by killing the fatted calf. I'm going to read that again. I don't think y'all caught that. When the son of yours came back after squandering all of your money on prostitutes, you celebrated by killing the fattened calf. And his father said to him, look, dear son, you have always stayed by me and everything I have is yours. You know this. We had to celebrate this happy day for your brother was dead and has come back to life. He was lost, but now he is found. Stretch your hands towards heaven. Pray for me as I pray for you. Holy Spirit of God, I declare it in this house that you would just move in our hearts and in our minds. Do what only you can do, Father. 
God, I declare right now that in the middle of this message, God, that your spirit would just begin to touch the hearts and the lives of all of your children in this house. God, that you would just move in a mighty way, God. Heal brokenness, God. Set free those that are bound and captive, God. Lord, as I preach, control my tongue, God. Lord, bring me into your holy place today. Lord, as I'm under assignment, I declare you would lead me today. Shut my mouth, shut my mind, shut my spirit, God, and let me convey what you would have to say to your children today on this Father's Day of 2022. And all we do, we give you the glory, we give you the praise, in Jesus' mighty, mighty name, everybody said amen. amen. Now you can be seated today. Thank you so much, praise team. You guys are fantastic. Come on, give it up for your praise team. One time, one good, good time. This morning I want to talk about simply the Father is. Somebody say the Father is. I'm going to give you guys a quick, quick tip. Y'all want a secret? The fastest way to get me to shut up and get out the door is you talk back to me. If we talk back to one another today, we can make our way to the Golden Corral before the Baptist Church gets out today. All right? All right? Amen. 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 So I want to talk about the Father is. And today we're going to focus a tad bit on the two sons, but we're going to, we're going to signify how the Father treated both of his sons. First, we have to look at where the sons come from. They come from a house that had land. There was fields to be tilled. There was fields of livestock to be maintained. There was fields of money. So this family was a wealthy family, a big house. Listen, I'm going to tell you right now, ain't no shack on the side of the road going to have enough to have all the hired servants and for a brother to be all the way out in the field and hear what's going on. Amen? It's going to be a very big house with lots of servants, with lots of people, a lot of moving parts. So not only was this family a wealthy family, this family was well known throughout the community. Anybody that has a family that is this influential in the community has status. Amen? So this family was wealthy. This family was popular. This family was generous. As we see, the father had plenty to give, and he didn't say, no, 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 you ain't taking mine yet. You can have what's mine when I'm gone. Listen, I'm going to tell you right now, this son, this younger son, how many of y'all know it's sometimes the younger siblings that... Um, <clears throat> Just say the craziest off-the-wall things. You know what I'm saying? I can say, <laughs> amen. Uh, I know that I can testify to that because I am the baby of my family. And you might say, wow, that really makes sense why you act the way you do. So that being said, this younger son did not have any filter. Okay? This younger son went to his dad and said, hey, dad, before you croak, I would like to have what's mine. I'm going to tell you right now, when my children get up older and they come up to me and say, hey, dad, before you die, let me get, I say, if you don't get from around me right now. But this son had no filter, all right? He went up to his dad and said, I love you. I love you. He went up to his dad and said, hey, dad, before you die, I need what's mine. I want what's mine. And the father said, okay, fine, take what's yours. So he divvied up the land, the money, and everything that he had and gave it to his son. This family communicated. It was a communicating family. How many of you all know that there are families out there that don't talk to one another? If you talk to somebody, uh, you might, me and my brother and my sister, uh, we love each other. If you guys are watching this, I love y'all. But we talk to each other, and we don't talk to each other every day. You know, there's, there's times where months go by, and we don't talk to each other. But when we see each other, it's like we, didn't, we haven't missed a beat. 
like nothing has changed. We've seen each other, talked to each other every single day. That's just the dynamics of our relationship. But if you were to ask me, say, hey, uh, Josh, have you talked to your brother lately? I'd say, no, we're family. We don't talk. I mean, that, let's just get real here, right? So the thing is, is this family communicated. This, this son had no problem approaching his father saying, hey, I want what's mine. Some, some, some children are afraid to approach their father or their mother. Amen? So they were not only wealthy, popular, generous, and communi- communicative, but they were a gracious family. They were a loving family a relational family, and a forgiving family. Because of who the son was connected to, he had status. Sometimes in life, it's not about what you know, but it's about who you know. Does anybody testify to that this morning? The son spent all of his money on prostitutes and partying. And some might say, wow, I didn't realize that he was such, I knew that he was the prodigal son and he left, but I didn't realize what all he spent his money and time on but yeah he spent his time on money on prostitutes and wild living but we will get into that very shortly society tries to drill in our minds that we have to be self-sufficient we have to be able to depend on ourselves. and if we don't depend on ourselves, if we have to depend on somebody else one it won't get done two We are not as strong as we ought to be if we have to depend on somebody. And the problem with society drilling into our minds that we have to depend or we have to only depend on ourselves. We can't place our trust or our confidence or anything that we have that is vulnerable. We can't give it to somebody else because then we make ourselves vulnerable and give the opportunity to get hurt, destroyed, broke, And we don't want that. But the problem is, is when society drills into our hearts and our minds that we have to be so self-dependent, we find ourselves stuck in a pickle because we have a hard time letting God take our burdens. No, God, I can do it myself. No, 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 God. I got myself into this mess, and I'll do it. It's not your responsibility, God, to take me out of this mess I made. It's not your responsibility, God, to to clean up my face. Now, I'm going to just go ahead and preface everything that I say today concerning parenting and fatherhood. I'm going to preface it by saying this. My baby is six months old. It is my first one, okay? Okay. We are, I love, do y'all love me? Do y'all love me? All right, well, I love y'all. Don't get offended because there'll be plenty of other times to get offended. We are just now moving into solid bowel movements. I never thought there would be a day in my life where I was like, thank God for a solid bowel movement. Never thought in my life. But the first one happened, I about shouted out my shoes. I'm going to tell you right now, I spoke in tongues. I said, God, you have done it again. Thank you, Jesus. So I preface everything by saying this. My baby is six months old. So I'm not going to sit here and try to pretend like I know all about parenting because I'm learning it right now as we're doing it. So everything I'm going to refer to or I'm going to talk to you about is just know I've just moved into solid bowel movements. (laughs) All right? So that being said, God, it's not, my, it's not your responsibility to take me out of this mess that I've made. I put myself into this position. God, I'm going to take myself out. God, you've got so many other things to worry about, God. I don't need you to do this because I can do it on my own. I, know I can't trust my husband to do it because I know for a fact, I know for a fact he will not get it done. You might say, I can't trust my wife to do it because I know for a fact it won't get done. But the problem is, is that God will always get it done. And we put all these binders and limitations on God because we have such a limited mind because we are so focused on being dependent and doing it ourselves. If my baby, who is now six months old and eating food, we transitioned into food, And she's got these sweet taters all over her face. If she looked up at me and said, Dad, 
I don't want you to clean up my face and my hair because I put the sweet potatoes on my face. It's not your job to clean my face. How silly does that sound? And, and, and I'm going to be as simple as I can be with this. It doesn't matter what you have done. God the Father is saying, if you would just stop and let me handle it. I don't care. Listen, I'm going to tell you right now. People say, oh, I've sinned so bad. I can't do it. I just can't. I can't, I can't even approach the Father because he just won't have me. It, does, it, it truly does not matter what you have done. As simple as sweet potatoes on your face. He's saying, come here, let me, let me get a wet wipe. Let me clean you up. When she gets sweet potatoes all over her face, I don't get mad at her. I'm not, I'm not mad at the world. Oh, my God, you got sweet potatoes on your face. And that's what I think we think that God says to us when we say, oh, God, I did it again. If you've been, listen, I just want to say this. If you've been dealing with an addiction or you've been dealing with a problem for years and you have just tried so hard to stop, you've tried so hard, and then you say, okay, God, this is the last time I'm going to do that. I swear on everything I love, God. Just help me to not do it again. This is it. And then the next day you do it again. You say, God, I did it again. I can't even, can't even look at myself. I'm telling you right now, God is just saying to you this morning, let me get a baby wipe and clean them sweet potatoes off of your face. As simple as that. So society makes us to think that we have to be so self-dependent and say, I can't give what's vulnerable away or be open to somebody because then they will know the real me. I can't open up to somebody because then they will know and then they'll go tell other people. And then now I've got a whole other issue to deal with. I can't, help, I can't put my trust into somebody else because I just I needed to get done. And God is saying this whole time, forget what the world is telling you and put it in my hands. So that will stop you from relying on the Father and depending on Him to heal you or deliver you from what you are dealing with today. Amen? Come on, somebody look at me and say, give it to the Father. Give it to the Father. The battle is not yours to fight. I'm going to tell you right now. If you, I, well, I've never backed down from a fight. I'll be honest with you right now. We're going we're, we're gonna to go B.C. here before Christ. Is that okay? Can I just talk to you real today? I've never backed down from no fight. And you know what that's done? That's got my butt kicked a bunch of times. But I'm going to tell you right now, God is saying to you this morning, he's saying, hey, listen, it don't matter what fight you have provoked or what fight you have caused or started, it's my fight. If Mike Tyson was to come walking through these doors ready to fight you, amen, yes. If Mike Tyson was ready to fight, come through these doors and fight you and God said, hey, I'll take care of this, I bet you wouldn't have no problem in the world saying, okay, God, you got it, and run the other way. Sometimes we look at some issues or some small little thing, and we say, no, God, no, God, this fight's, I can't give this fight to you because I got it. I'll take care of it, and then it never gets done. Point number one, if you're taking notes this morning, I want to talk to you about is the Father is stable. He is a stable, consistent being that has always been the thing that as an ordained minister and in study I think to myself how in the world can God be now y'all ain't y'all are too spiritual I know y'all are too spiritual and y'all just understand everything and every dark mystery that is revelatory in the Bible and you don't have no questions whatsoever but for someone like me I, I think to myself how can God have always been. And the only thing that I can come to the conclusion of is I have no idea. But that is because us as human beings, we are born and we have a beginning. And it is appointed once unto man to die. So we're all going to be gone one day. Amen? So how can somebody with a mind like ours that knows beginning and knows end, how can we sit there and comprehend something that has never just had a start. It's hard to understand. 
But God has always been. He is stable. He is the same yesterday, today, tomorrow, next year. He is the same before COVID, during COVID, after COVID. He is the same no matter what war we're in. He is the same no matter what our country looks like. We could be on the top of the world or we could be in the bottom of the pit. But God is still God and he will always be. He is stable. I want to go ahead and read the definition out of Webster's Dictionary. I was talking to my family and I thought to myself, I said, you know what? I think Webster was under the influence of the Holy Spirit when he was writing the definition for the word stable. Ask me, say, hey, Pastor Josh, what does stable mean? Stable, the definition out of Webster's Dictionary is firmly established. Fixed and steadfast. How many of you all know that God is firm, fixed, and steadfast? Nothing can shake him. No fire, no form of hell, no power of darkness can shake the kingdom of heaven. God is the firm foundation of what we can put our trust in today. And I just stopped by Titusville, Florida this morning to tell you that God is going to stand firm and steadfast. My God, I tell you, Webster was filled with the Holy Ghost when he wrote this. Firmly established, fixed and steadfast. Not changing. How many of y'all people? How many of y'all people know people with different personalities? You never know what you're gonna get. Like a like a, Mama always says, a box of chocolates. They got a box of chocolates personality. You never know which one you're gonna get. You truly don't. Firmly established, fixed, steadfast. Not changing. I'm so happy that God does not change his mind. God does not change his personality. One day he's an angry God. Sometimes we feel like God is just an angry, mad kid with a magnifying glass standing over top of an anthill and just... But I'm telling you, God has never been that way. God is not a God of anger. God is a God of love. And he will not change from that. His stance towards you is love and affection. And he wants you. He is not changing and he is not fluctuating. He doesn't get bigger and smaller as time goes on. He doesn't, it doesn't matter what the atmospheric pressure is. It doesn't matter if, the, if, 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 if everything is right, if everything is wrong. God is still the same huge, ginormous God he has always been. And he will not change. He is permanent. Oh, sorry. What am I saying? He. This is just Webster's definition of the word stable. Well, that's water. Thank God for the water of life. He is permanent. He is enduring, steady in purpose, firm in resolution, not subject to insecurity or emotional illness. Come on, somebody. God is not subject to insecurity or emotional illness. This is this this one right here. This is the last one, the last def- part of the definition of the word stable, according to Webster. This is what really got into my spirit. Designed so that as to develop forces to restore the original condition when disturbed from the condition of equilibrium of steady motion. Designed so as to develop forces that restore the original condition when disturbed from a condition or equilibrium or steady motion. If you say, Josh, I have no idea what you just said, I'll explain it to you. It means that God is able to restore you No matter what attaches itself to you, no matter what you go through, if you go through the fire, you're going to come out as pure gold. You're going to come out better than you did. God is not sitting, oh, well, you messed up now. Now you look ridiculous, and you're going to stand there with egg and sweet potato on your face. No, God is in the restoring business. God says, hey, come here. I'm going to put back together. I'm going to restore what the locust and the canker worm tried to destroy. I'm going to restore unto you everything that the devil tried to take. I stand here before you as someone that has struggled from suicidal depression. I come before you today as somebody that has struggled that wants to give it all up and not move another step forward. But God has 
sustained me. He has endured me and brought me to the end. And I serve notice on the devil. You should have killed me when you had the chance. Because I tell you right now that God is doing something inside of me that nothing can stop. I've got a fire shut up in my bones. And if it is the last thing I do, that fire is going to translate and be, I love you. And I'm going to, the spirit of God is tangible. Tangible meaning it can pass from one being to another. And th that baby right there is going to have the fire of God in her life. And she will grow up knowing the power of the Holy Spirit. So the father is stable. Come on, somebody say the father is stable. The father is forgiveness. Oh, let me, let me, let me digress one second. I'm sorry. So the son, he had left he took everything that was his, went on, spent all of his money, came to his senses, and came home. While he was gone, the father didn't miss a beat. The father kept doing what he was doing. God is stable. The father is stable. It doesn't matter. And I'm just going to be real with you because I've had people in my life that have been real with me. It doesn't matter what you do. If you turn your back on God, if you don't turn your back on God, if you stay uh, steadfast or if you just say, you know what, I'm just not going to give everything I got anymore. The kingdom of God and the Father will not be moved. It will not miss a beat. It will go forward and it will still do all that it is going to do because God the Father is stable. The God the Father is forgiveness. Somebody say God is forgiveness. And so I am forgiven. Come on, somebody say, God is forgiveness. And so I am forgiven. Sometimes in life we have a problem forgiving people. Sometimes we have a problem in our life forgiving those that have wronged us and those that have hurt our feelings. And I just want to say that it is time for the church to stop fighting one another. Listen, I'm going to tell you right now, just because someone hurts you does not mean that you have to forgive them and then invite them over to your house. Amen? You come and you hurt me, that's fine, I forgive you. My wife and I, we know, listen, my wife, let me come over and stand by this beautiful woman. My wife has had to teach me boundaries. Because people can walk all over me. And I don't care, don't bother me. Don't bother me, not one bit. But I look like a fool. My wife has had to teach me boundaries. Just because someone has hurt you, you should forgive them. I, I have no problem forgiving people. I, I, listen, I do not hold on to anything. That's the God's honest truth. But I'll tell you right now that I forgive you, and I'd be like, oh, yeah, you want to go, go to the McDonald's? And set myself up for another failure. So just because someone hurts you and you forgive them does not mean that you have to invite them over to your house and cook them a meal. But if you can't forgive, how can the Father forgive you? That's scripture. You have to be able to forgive. The Father is forgiveness, and so I am forgiven. And I, listen, I'm telling you right now, I have done a lot of things in my life that I am not proud of. And I have been forgiven time and time and time and time again. And I have been shown forgiveness. And I think that is one reason why I have no problem forgiving people. Because I have done so many dumb things and made so many dumb decisions. But the Spirit of God pulls me to forgiveness every single time. And so I know what it's like to be forgiven. And if you know what it's like to be forgiven, my God, I mean, come on, somebody in this house, if you know that God has forgiven you of everything that you have ever done, it doesn't matter how dark, how bad it is, you are forgiven. And you know how good it feels that when you're like standing on the other end of that and you're like, oh, man, here I am having to ask for forgiveness again. They might not forgive me this time. But then when they're like, I forgive you. That, that relief of your, on your heart, that feeling that you get inside is like, everything's okay. Everything's going to be okay. So I know what it's like to be forgiven and to stand in forgiveness. So this son, he puts this speech together. He says, all right, 
I'm starving. I can't even think straight. I'm going to put a speech together very quickly. I'm going to go to my father, and I'm going to say, Hey, Dad, I have sinned against heaven. How many of y'all know that sometimes we exaggerate our sin? It is the worst thing ever. Sometimes in the church, and I'm going to talk about religious folk here, which there's no religious folk in this house. I know that. But there is religious folk that will say, hey, listen, you have sinned so bad, you have to sit over on the other section in the back where no one can see you. There are people that say you have sinned so bad that you, are just, you should just be ashamed of yourself. You have sinned so bad. And sometimes we look at ourselves and we say, man, I have sinned so bad. I have sinned against heaven. And the father's like, what are you talking about? So he says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to my father. I'm going to say, I have sinned against heaven. And I have sinned against you. And please, just hire me as one of your hired servants. I don't deserve to be your son. And what we do, whether good or bad, will not stop what the father is doing. In the Jewish culture, let me go ahead and just tell you why this is... And as far as what the son says to the father, the son says, hey, father, I have sinned against you and I have sinned against heaven and just hire me as one of your servants. Because in the Jewish culture, it does not permit you to accept a rebellious child back into your home. If a child rebels and runs away, you can, if you can bring that son or that daughter home. But, and the custom is, you bring them back as a hired servant. They're not your child anymore. They sleep where the servants sleep. They work when the servants work. You're not, the status that he once had is gone. We talked about that, right? Because of who he's connected to, he had status. He had influence. When he walked into town, they were like, oh, yeah, that's JoJo's son. Yeah, I know him. Yeah, he's great. But now, he's returning home. He knows. He knows for a fact. The only way to come home would be to be hired on as a hired servant at the house. And now when he walks through town, nobody's going to say, oh, hey, yeah, that's JoJo's son. No. That's one of the guys that works at JoJo's house. That's one of, that's, that's, I don't even know that guy's name. So he knows that he's lost his status. So he loses his status, he loses everything that he has. In the culture, that is the only way, in the Jewish culture, that is the only way for the father to have been able to accept his son or for the son to have come back home. That being said, the father is gracious. Come on, somebody say the father is gracious. Now, you might think this morning, what is the difference between mercy and and grace. I'm glad you asked. So mercy is you're driving down the interstate. Now I want you to go, hey, everybody in this house, if you got a pocketbook or a purse by you, go ahead and just hold that pocketbook by you, put it in your hand, and close your eyes. I want you to imagine something with me. So you're driving down the interstate and you're going about 85 miles an hour. Next thing you know, you see red and blue lights behind you. And it's not a, it's not a county sheriff's officer. It's not a sheriff's deputy, no. Now, if y'all guys got your eyes open, I need you to, I need you to focus and, and, and really imagine what I'm telling you. It's not a sheriff's deputy. You look a little closer. Oh, no, it's not a... City police officer. Nope, nope, nope. It is a Florida state trooper. <laughs> and God knows that you have not prayed all day, but when you see that sheriff, uh, that Florida state trooper behind you, you have been the most spiritual you have been in months. God, our Father in heaven, right now in the mighty name of Jesus, I just declare your goodness and your mercy over me. God, right now, I know I was speeding, God, but I ask you for forgiveness, God. Please, God, please don't... Uh, you know for a fact, you guys can open your eyes now. If you get pulled over by a Florida state trooper, let's just go ahead and just put out, 
a state trooper in any state, you're going to get a ticket. Those boys do not play. They, listen, one of, one of the requirements to be a Florida state trooper is you had to drop out of kindergarten because they tried to make you play at recess. They don't play. Okay? So you've got a state trooper behind you. You're getting pulled over, and you know for a fact you're getting a ticket. Mercy is the trooper coming up saying, hey, listen, I clocked you doing 85. It's a $500 ticket. I'm going to let you go. I'm not going to give you a ticket today. That is mercy. Amen. Grace is so much more than mercy. Now, when the Bible says mercy and grace, that combination is huge. But mercy is great. Mercy, hey, he let me go. I don't got no ticket. Grace is that state trooper comes up to your window and says, hey, son, or hey, sis, I clocked you doing 85. That's a $500 ticket. I'm not going to give you a ticket. And he, pull, he pulls his billfold out of his back pocket and pulls out $500, puts his billfold back in and says, I'm not going to give you a $500 ticket, but here's $500 for you to go spend on anything that you want to go spend on. That, my friend, is grace. And so I just want to tell you right now that God is a God of grace. He is gracious to you. It doesn't matter what you do or what you say. God is a God of grace. He is willing to give you more than you could ever imagine. That's why the Bible says that God is calling us from glory to glory, deeper into his presence. There's so much stuff, sis, that we have the potential to tap into that we say, oh, no, I don't want to go that far. I don't want, that's just too much revelation. And that's just too much spirit of God. I can't go any farther. And God's saying, I've got so much more. Listen, we're over here drinking from a, 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 a water fountain. And we're thinking, oh, all my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With this little stream of water coming out of a water fountain. And God's saying, I've got a fire hydrant that is just, I've got that for you. And we get satisfied, caught up with a little, I'll just tell you, brother, God has been so good to me today. When God's like, you have not tapped into the full potential of what I have because his grace, oh my gosh. I'm, down, I'm, down, I'm telling you, if you got pulled over by a state trooper and he gave you money, you, you'd probably just pull off to the side of the road and say, I need a minute, I can't drive. So that's the difference between mercy and grace. The Father, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to come out with six different things that the Father did in this situation that he was in. Number one, the Father was filled with compassion. That indicates that our God, the Father, is compassionate for his lost children. When the son was far off, he saw his son with compassion and ran to meet him. He didn't wait for him to come up. Sometimes we think to ourselves, we got we to gotta make our long travel back to where we messed up and do this and do... God's saying, I will meet you right where you're at today. Amen. So number two, he ordered the servants to put a robe on his son. There are times in our life where we have had clothes on and we, now, remember, six-month-old, I'm just preaching what I know. There are times where we spit up on ourselves and we look disgusting. And God's saying, come here, let me, let me change your clothes. Let me put a new robe on you. You've been out there with the pigs. Man, I can only imagine what the father would have said. He said, boy, you stink. Where's your clothes? Somebody get this boy some clothes. So this son had this, all, this whole speech planned out. God, our Father, I have sinned against heaven. I've sinned against you. And if you notice, in the scripture, the son comes up and says all those things. But then the father doesn't even address the son. He's like, 
Can somebody get this guy a robe? He puts a robe on his son. That indicates that God will dress us when we come to him with robes of righteousness. Number three, he ordered the servants to put a ring on his finger. Now, I don't know if you understand what a ring is symbolic of, but it is your status. If everything that we've talked about this morning, I want you guys to understand that when I say that the Jewish culture says that the only way for that boy to come back to his house where he grew up was to be hired on as a servant, was that that's it. He's not a son of that house anymore. And the father says, I hear what you're saying, you're forgiven. Get this boy a ring, put it back on his finger. Your status is not up for grabs. The father will restore everything to you. So the father puts status back on his son. The father is the only one that deter determines your position. He tells his servants, put some sandals on this boy's feet. Another status. Because servants weren't allowed to wear shoes. Only the family. Only the people that were there. The father, the son. They were the only people allowed to wear shoes. He said, Let me, let's, put some, let's put some sandals on this boy's feet. He was prepared for the rest of his life to not have a ring on his finger, to not wear a robe, and to not have shoes on his feet. He was okay with that. He came up to the road. And the father says, let this boy get a robe on him, let this boy get a, a ring back on his finger, and let this boy get some shoes on his feet. Walking around with old Circle K feet. <clears throat> the, fa the father is the only one that determines your position. Nobody else can determine your position. And I feel like God is positioning people in this house now, in this moment. You might say, well, I don't feel like God's positioning me. I don't feel like God is doing anything in me. But I just have news for you this morning that God is positioning you as long as you let him. Amen. He ordered the servants to kill the fatted calf. This boy, if we recall, this boy was hungry. He wasn't hungry. He was hungry. He was, he was ready to eat some slop. One of the things that pigs will eat is a corn on the cob. And they'll eat it with no corn on it. I thought about this. While I was putting this together, I'm just going to tell you how my brain works. When I was putting this together, I thought to myself, how hungry does one person have to be to look at a corn cob that has no corn on it? You're like, all right. <laughs> and eat a corn cob. You got to be hungry. You got to be hungry. So this boy was hungry. The father said, let's, fill the, let's kill the fatted calf. Let's do what we got to do to get some food in this boy's belly. Let's have a party. He celebrated, number six, he celebrated his son's return. When sinners repent, it is a great joy to heaven and to the Father. It doesn't matter if you've never given your heart to Christ. It doesn't matter if you have given your heart to Christ every day since 1985. When you say, God, come into my life, I need you, and you mean it, all of heaven rejoices. The Father is relational. Somebody say, the Father is relational. The Father wants to have a relationship with you. The difference between me and most people is somebody might say, well, I consider myself to be a religious individual. I am not religious whatsoever. Jesus has broke the spirit of religion off of me a long time ago. And I just want to tell you that the thing that we have to focus on today in today's society is relationships. We have such a hard time because the church has drilled in religion to our brains. It's not about relationship. And so we are vulnerable to relationships. We don't want to have relationships because when we have relationships, then we are vulnerable to get hurt or to be uh, um, um, made fun of or look ridiculous. And so God is just longing to have a relationship with you this morning. So the son comes home and the father says, finally, my son 
son who was dead and gone has come back and he is alive. He was lost and now he is found. And the brother was out in the field. And he said, what in the world is going on up there? We're going to look at some religious folk this morning. Now, I know not none of y'all in this house gossip. So I'm just going to preach to the wall for a minute. The brother, he said, hey, hey, come over here. He said to one of the servants, he said, hey, what's going on up there? What's, what's, the, what's the scoop? Tell me what's going on. And the servant said, hey, listen, you'll never believe this. <laughs> Old boy came back home, and now your father's having a huge party for him, and they killed the fatted calf. And oh, my God. That older brother was mad. He was mad. Praise him. If I can get you guys to come back up here. Religious folks will get mad when God blesses you. Religious folks will get upset and not celebrate with you. You might, you, might, you might find $10,000 in a brown paper bag on the side of the road, and then some religious nut will say, oh, pff, 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 pff. oh, yeah, let me guess, God did that for you. But I tell you right now that a person that does not have the bondage of religion on their life is a free individual amen that being said last and final point the father is love if you had a problem growing up and you didn't come from a loving household you didn't have a father that loved you you didn't have what you deserved as a individual the father is standing in front of you this morning with arms stretched out wide saying come home I've got so much love to give you amen the, other, the older son knew his father's love, but was done. He was tired. He said, I've been obedient to you. This, the, the, the love that you have, is, it, he doesn't deserve it. But the father says, my love is for everybody. My love is for you. All over this house, stand to your feet this morning. With every head bowed and every eye closed in this house, if you have never given your heart to Christ, Today is the day of salvation. If you've never given your heart to Christ, raise your hand up in this place. The only people looking around is Pastor and myself. So I'm assuming that everybody in this house has given their heart to Christ and knows Jesus as their personal Savior. This morning, I just want to say, if everybody would look this way, that the Father is stable. The Father is forgiving. The Father is love. The Father wants a relationship with you. And so we need to tap into that every single day. I'm going to pray for you guys as we go. And just know that as a father in this place, we are mirrors of God the Father. Lord, we love you and we thank you, God. We give you all the glory and all the praise and all the honor. God, I pray right now in the mighty name of Jesus that you would rise up inside of us as fathers. God, that you would move in a mighty way. Give us strength. Give us wisdom. Lord, I pray, God, for everybody that's been in this house today, God, that doesn't know the love of a father. God, that you would touch them. Hold them. Do what only you can do. In the mighty name of Jesus, everybody in this house said, amen. Happy Father's Day. We'll see you guys on Wednesday at, oh, and if you're a father and you did not get a gift up here on the table, we have a Father's Day table full of surprises. All right, and we'll see you on Wednesday, 7 o'clock. <laughs>